you very much, and thank you for having me back. My name is Chris Epting. I've written about 28 or 29 books about history and travel, and I have this thing where I like to go stand and locate where stuff happened, but where there's no sign. My first book was called James Dean Died Here, and it was about that exact spot where Dean took his last breath, but it was about 700 other places that are like that, where we know the picture, we know the event, we know where the Hindenburg, you've all seen the Hindenburg footage and oh, the humanity, but what would happen if you went and stood there today? That's what drives a lot of my passion in history, is discovering things like that, places you might pass every day and not know that something really notable took place there. So one of those things for me happened when I was, again, as a kid, I saw this picture of Teddy Roosevelt, and it was in school, and I thought, in my head, 10, 11 years old, I thought, how does the President of the United States, A, look like this, with riding chaps and a neckerchief and a hat, and where is he standing? This, when I saw this picture, Richard Nixon was President. So that, in my head, is what a President was, right? That, that's how they're supposed to look. That's my first reference, really. And I thought, no, 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 this is a president that I could, as, even as a kid I could support. And, and it, as I became older, I wanted to, to, again, trace the legacy of this photo. And it led me to this remarkable story. I think it's remarkable that we'll talk about in a minute. Very briefly to kind of set the table, 1903, which is where our story is going to take place, is a monumental year in a lot of ways. 1903 is the year that the Wright brothers first fly Kitty Hawk. That's 1903. The first Model A rolls off the line in 1903. 1903 is a very big year. More relevant for us here tonight, 1903 is the year that a film called The Great Train Robbery was, was produced. Arguably, I guess we're in the, the first narrative film, I mean the first, in terms of silent film, the first movie to tell a story was 1903, and it starred Bronco Billy, who as you know has an amazing legacy right here in town. So I love the fact that that lines up tonight for us, that 1903 produces that film. That film was so revolutionary. I mean, it was the first time a film had used location shoots to give you an idea of where we are in history at that point. And it's in this year that Teddy Roosevelt, who was the president for two years at that point, if you probably know he wasn't elected, he became president when William McKinley was assassinated in Buffalo in 1901. The Republicans, they didn't like Teddy Roosevelt. They actually had made him vice president to get rid of him and shut him up. Little did they know <laughs> that they had really made their own bed. And tragically, after the assassination, lo and behold, who emerges but Teddy Roosevelt, full of fire and full of everything they wanted to sort of tamp down. And what he realized two years into the presidency, there was an election year the next year, he had never been out west. And so in his mind, he thought, I want to I wanna, I wanna get out there. I want to kind of firm up some votes. I want to get my platform out there. But earlier in his life, a couple of years earlier, he had fallen in love with the writings of a guy named John Muir. Has anybody ever heard of John Muir? <laughs> this room, I'm sure. I love rooms. Anybody, you come to an event like this, and I don't have to, the frames of reference, I don't have to explain anything, thank God. And John Muir, um, of course, the great naturalist, had written a number of books and articles that Roosevelt had really fallen for. Teddy Roosevelt was an outdoorsman. He was a hunter. Um, he wasn't a conservationist yet. In Teddy Roosevelt's mind, there was no fear, you know, back when he was in the, the Badlands, wherever he was, nature wasn't in jeopardy. John Muir out here in California had a different notion at that point. He was getting nervous. He saw things encroaching. He saw logging. He did have concerns, but what Roosevelt did is he mapped this trip out. This trip was going to be nine weeks away from the White House. Put that in perspective, more than two months away from the White House on a train, stagecoach, and horses. Okay, it's pre, essentially pre-automobile. There are cars, but not commercially, really, not for this trip. So Roosevelt plans this, this road trip of the ages. His family's not gonna go with him, it's gonna be just him, and it's gonna be a whistle-stop tour, which of course means they will park the train whenever he says stop, and he'll get off the back of the train, and he will give speeches wherever he wants to. On this trip, he gives more than 300 speeches. It's an incredible trip. But what he really wants to do, part of his MO, is he wants to meet John Muir, and not just meet John Muir. He has read Muir right about the Yosemite, as, as it was called. I don't, know, I don't know where the the left. People ask me, I don't know the answer. No one seems to know the answer. We call it Yosemite today. Back then, it was the Yosemite. It was more of a collective. Uh, that's what I think the reference was. And so Roosevelt wants to meet John Muir, but he wants Muir to take him through the Yosemite. So it begins with Roosevelt writes Muir a letter. And it says, through the cur my, my dear Mr. Muir, through the courtesy of President Wheeler, I have already begun, uh, been in communication with you, but I wish to write you personally to express my hope that you will, 
that, ah, there we go, that you will be able to take me through the Yosemite. I do not want anyone with me but you. This is where it's, it becomes almost like a love letter, and you can hear real passion in Roosevelt's voice. I love, Roosevelt's a wonderful man of letters, as we'll see later as well, but I want to drop politics absolutely for four days and just be out of the open with you. Um, John Burroughs is probably going through the uh, Yellowstone Park with me, and I want to go with you through the Yosemite. Sincerely yours, Theodore Roosevelt. Um, when Muir receives this letter, Muir has plans to be in Europe at that time. So he says to a friend of his, I wish I could go, but I can't. And his friend says, are you crazy? This is a journalist. He said, you've got Teddy Roosevelt. Think of what he could do to help you. You know, put on, wear a different hat right now. You can, you can always go to Europe, but for Teddy Roosevelt to want to spend time with you, you need to take this trip. And, and, and Muir rethinks it now. What I think is fascinating is Muir responds. Look at the proper nature of this letter. It's, it's typed beautifully. It's, you know, double spaced. This is what he receives. This is Muir's note, and this is the great dichotomy. These two men are so different. They're both um, very strong-willed. They both have monumental egos, but as we can decipher here, dear Mr. Roosevelt, I sincerely thank you for the honor you do me in hoping I may be able to take you through the Yosemite. An engagement to go abroad with Professor Sargent at first stood in the way, but a few small changes <laughs> have brought our trip into harmony with yours, it's so poetic, of course I shall go with you gladly, faithfully yours, John Muir. So now the game is on. And now in the back of Roosevelt's mind, he knows he's got nine weeks ahead of him, but all he's thinking about are these three days. Um, he can't wait to get on the road. And so on the road he goes. This is the train. Now, the, the very back car was Roosevelt's. It was called the Elysian. And it was a beautifully appointed Pullman car, redwood teak. It was a king's traveling car. It really was. And that was Teddy Roosevelt's car. And so that was the car where he would stop. Again, they could stop anywhere, and, and, and he could get out and give his speeches. Day two of the trip, they leave April 1st, 1903. Day two, they're in Chicago, and, and Roosevelt gives an address that night at a union hall where he uses the term for the first time, walk softly and carry a big stick. So this trip early on produces some, some cultural interest and things we, we remember today. Um, as the trip progresses, Word gets out, and cowboys, people, everyone chases the train. Roosevelt going west is a very big deal. The press, you know, it's funny. If you look at the situation today with the president and the press and sort of the antagonistic relationship, it wasn't that different in 1903. The press held it against uh, Roosevelt that he was a hunter, okay? The press back then had a, had a view of the world where they didn't, in general, like the fact that the leader of the free world was an avid hunter, or a true sport hunter, and they would poke fun at him and sort of go after him and made a mockery of this trip. Um, but, but the people loved it, and the cowboys would come out, and people were absolutely thrilled the fact that Teddy Roosevelt would soon be coming through their small towns. This is an example. This is a Puck magazine, which is a satirical political magazine. And you can see them kind of poking gentle fun. The babies are crying because they think that Roosevelt is going to be hunting them out on the road. <laughs> and, and Puck, throughout this entire nine-week thing, they were making fun of this whole, this whole notion that Roosevelt didn't want to just go to the Yosemite with Muir. He wanted to disappear for four days. He didn't want any press, any handlers, nothing. And that was going to be, that's the trip that he wanted to tr truly script. Roosevelt was a big kid on this trip. He loved trains. He would sneak up in the middle of the night. So they, they would ask the engineers if he could pull the whistle in the middle of the night. And they would let him. He would sit with the guy shoveling coal. He would, he wanted to connect with people so much. He, if he saw cowboys in the, coming across the American West, he would have them stop the train. There were nights I documented in the book where he got out and he not only cooked for these guys around campfires, but he bust their plates. And again, he drove his staff crazy. He was so wildly unpredictable, but he wanted to make connections with people, and that's what he did. And I think that really, to me, of this whole trip, the enthusiasm, this boyishness that he had, this love of life and love of country is evident every mile of this trip. Um, we talk a little bit about technology, Wright Brothers, the first car. For a trip like this, you know, there were no microphones were not invented yet. There were no microphones. Roosevelt is speaking regularly to people of 5, 10, 15,000. He gave the commencement at Berkeley on this trip at the Greek theater with no microphone. And there were 12,000 people there. So how did he do it? You read about this and you research this, and Roosevelt, politicians back then that succeeded were orators. 
They knew how to project. They knew how to throw themselves back. Roosevelt spoke to the back of the room. But back then, what you also learn in researching is that audiences were naturally quiet. They knew there was no amplification. So to hear anything, everything became still. And for people that couldn't hear in the back, people would, would like the telephone game, they would pass back what was being said. So the way speeches were given, the dynamics were entirely different. It was a, it was a much more of a piece of theater that was being given. And Roosevelt was, was an absolutely gifted orator and knew how to deliver um, himself to the people and, and again, deliver he did throughout. Again, pictures from the American West. Roosevelt is seeing Yellowstone for the first time. On this trip, he sees the Grand Canyon for the first time. Here's an example of what a whistle stop looked like. Again, he would stop spontaneously. The crowds would gather. He would come out. He would give impromptu speeches. They would have prepared texts for him. He would, he would blow it off. He would meet a local and learn some facts about the area, incorporate those, and he spoke from his heart. I mean, again, this is a different, it's an entirely different era of, uh, of politicking. Again, more mockery, getting back to uh, the magazine. This is Roosevelt at Yosemite. As that trip grows closer, people can't believe he's gonna disappear for three days. People can't comprehend the president is really gonna do this. And his staff begins trying to talk him out of it, but he doesn't care. He's gonna meet John Muir. That's where his head and heart are. Um, Okay, the way he's going to meet Muir is, once Roosevelt, okay, Roosevelt arrives in Barstow, at first up in California, goes to LA, Pasadena, slowly works his way north. He stops in Santa Barbara, comes up north, San Luis Obispo. He goes to San Jose. As close as he came to us tonight was in Campbell, just outside San Jose, where he planted two trees on May 4th, I believe. Come May 11th, it's time to get to Yosemite. The way he's going to meet Muir is, they're going to meet in San Francisco. Muir lives in Martinez, where the martini was invented, as you might know. It's another book of mine. Um, and Muir is going to go into the city and meet Roosevelt at a hotel where he's giving a speech. And they're going to get on a train and then take the train to Yosemite. Muir gets to the hotel with a journalist friend again. And he hears, he sees it's packed. And he hears the noise and the ribald. And Muir says, I can't go in there. It's, I'll, I'll, I'll be up late. Muir had an 8 PM bedtime. But he, he wouldn't, didn't matter if he the president. So Muir skips it. He goes to the train and goes to sleep in his berth. Roosevelt blows in about two in the morning, as he would. The train pushes out from Oakland and goes to a town called Raymond. Raymond used to be the get called the gateway to Yosemite. At seven in the morning, Roosevelt gets up, he knocks on Muir's door, and that's where they meet for the first time in Raymond. From that point, Roosevelt comes outside of the Bowens Hotel. You can barely see him there. He gives a quick and prompt speech, and then it's on the stagecoach for an eight-hour ride to Yosemite, about 35 miles. And we, my daughter and I actually went and followed the, what would have been the stagecoach route then, which is still kind of a rough road getting up there. But again, those eight hours, the president on a stagecoach for eight hours to show you how different times were. But in those eight hours, it gave Muir and Roosevelt a chance to talk. And Muir showed, talked all about the area, and, and it gave him sort of a, a little primer on what was going to be happening once they got there. They arrive at Yosemite, and... They go to the Wawana Hotel. Has anybody ever stayed there in the Wawana? Great old hotel. The Wawana thinks that Roosevelt is going to stay there. They've got a little presidential area set for him. They haven't got the memo that he's camping out for three nights. So they're, they're really annoyed when he gets there. And Roosevelt says, look, we'll have lunch here. Ro hotels like to be able to say a president slept there. It's a mar it was a marketing thing back then. Roosevelt said, Muir and I will have lunch here. You can say we had lunch here, and that'll be it. They have their lunch. They get in the stagecoach, and then they go off to the Mariposa Grove, Roosevelt's first redwoods and sequoias. Roosevelt cannot believe what, what Yosemite, even in this sort of limited scope so far, looks like. And that first night, he and Muir are going to spend the night out there. You know, they take some, you can see Muir and Roosevelt together there in the center, and some of Roosevelt's staff. What the plan is, is for Roosevelt and Muir to be joined by two guys, a cook and a guy who's gonna pack the horses up, and that's it. And the rule is they will stay away from the two men and kind of let them have their privacy. They eavesdrop a little bit, but once these, these images are taken, these kind of little photo ops, and of course, the, I like to do then and now photography, so that is the exact same site today. It, again, it gets me in this thing of standing there and thinking Roosevelt and Muir, they breathe this air right here. You know what I mean? I do a lot of this kind of stepping into a space. That means a lot to me. Um, from that tree, they of course went through the tree tunnel. If you go to the tree tunnel today, I think I have it here. The tree came down in 1969, but it's still there. You can still sort of stand there and, and get that feeling of what it was like when those men go through. And from there, they set off into the wild. Now, 
Again, we've got two men here with pretty big egos and very different personalities. Um, one thing about Roosevelt Muir doesn't like, he's a hunter for sport. Roosevelt is okay with hunting for food. He doesn't like hunting. In fact, there's a passage that Muir wrote where he was a young man first visiting the Yosemite and he instinctively kills a rattlesnake um, that he saw one day on the trail. He kills it with a stick. It pained him so much. He writes an essay about it that night. I, I, you talk, the essay, you get so chucked up reading it because he describes the fight the snake put up and, and, and how it destroyed Muir to have killed. He, to him, it was senseless killing. And he never quite got over that rattlesnake killing. So Muir really prized natural life. And, and, and you know he knew about Roosevelt, but he didn't want to address that quite yet. So they spend night one of the Mariposa Grove. And by the two guides' accounts, what they say is that Roosevelt and Muir were kind of stoic with each other. They were still kind of feeling each other out. There wasn't a lot of chatter, but they were sort of trying to, to create some kind of semblance of a friendship. Again, two men from very different backgrounds and careers thrown together. It's night two where things really kick in. They wake up the next morning, they get on their horses, and they're out right up to Glacier Point. And that's where the two guides say that the men became like little kids together. They get to Glacier Point, it's snowfall. Now down below at the Wawana, the staff, Roosevelt staff is thinking, they're gonna get a foot of snow up there tonight. And there's no radio contact. Nobody knows if he's alive up there. He was very much alive. He, they get up there, Muir lights a dead tree on fire. It's this huge pyre for Roosevelt as sort of a natural gift, which Roosevelt does a dance around. These men are becoming friends. They, they, um, the snow comes down. There are no tents. They're sleeping outside. Roosevelt's one creature comfort was he wanted 40 flannel blankets to sleep on. That's what they pack on a horse every night. No tent, just the 40 blankets and a pillow. But that night over a fire, what happened was, now they know each other, there's a comfort level. And Muir confronts Roosevelt about the hunting, which one of the, this guy, Charles Lights, the, the guide says, Roosevelt's very taken aback. He's known this guy 24 hours, and he's got him in his face over a campfire, challenging him, telling him why you've got to stop acting a little boy, you've got to put your gun down, and you've got to stop killing things to kill things. And Roosevelt took this in, and there was a pause. And by their accounts, Roosevelt said to him, you know what, I will, I will take heed. I will, there's something about Muir that he respected. And if you look at Roosevelt's life from that point on, the sport hunting almost goes away. I mean, it really is, it's a monumental thing. But more importantly than that, that night, is the two men begin talking about this system. Muir, Muir tells Roosevelt, you need to be worried about this. And Roosevelt says, well, what do you mean? Like I said earlier, Roosevelt didn't know there was any danger out there. Muir begins laying out what he thinks are very real dangers about encroachments on nature and preservation. And that's where they begin talking about this idea of a system where they could organize and catalog and maintain a series of places that would ultimately want, end up looking a lot like the national park system. I mean, these, this to me is the night when those, pleats are, those seeds are truly planted. Because if you look at Roosevelt's history afterwards, he goes back to DC. As I outlined in the book, he can't sign things fast enough to save property and save things in, in Muir's name. I mean, hundreds of things that Roosevelt saw, hundreds of bills to preserve nature, all from this second night that started up at Glacier Point, where these men kind of you know, really found a common ground, and Roosevelt then understood that there were things to be concerned about. I think more than anything that night, Roosevelt got the fact that you can't rest on your laurels. You can't just assume everything's gonna be okay, because he had this impassioned, articulate Scotsman saying to him, you can't take it for granted. You've got to really worry about protecting Mother Nature. So they have this amazing night up at Glacier Point. Down below, everyone is freaked out beyond. They don't know what's happened. The next day, they hear the thundering herd coming down the horses. They're a sigh of relief that Roosevelt is alive, everything is okay. But Roosevelt doesn't want to partake in any of the social things they've set up. This photo, by the way, I, it, it's that photo I talked about. Roosevelt had a photographer ridden up the next day. He knew he wanted this moment preserved. Roosevelt was very shrewd when it came to public relations and this image of, of this almost character he had created for himself. And, and there you have him posing uh, atop Glacier Point. He wanted Muir in one photo, and I think this photo really tells as big a story as exists in this whole thing. If you look at how they're dressed, I mean, when Muir, when he would hike, he would wear a frock, he would wear, he would wear a shirt and tie. Muir had a formality in nature. I mean, he respected nature so much that he almost, it was almost like going to church, and he had said as much that it was a sanctuary, it was a cathedral. And even if you look, you know, Roosevelt, hand on hip, stoic, looking right at camera, 
Muir is even looking at camera. Muir rarely engaged. Muir wasn't comfortable on camera. Muir didn't believe in sort of trivializing these moments with photography and all. But at the president's request, he did it. And I think, again, that photo, just even the way they're dressed, the way they're posed, the way they look, it, it's, it's the dichotomy. It's what makes them so different. Yet together, there's something between them really magical that's come out of this, uh, out of this meeting thus far. Um, that's the site where they stood today. Again, for me, it's about standing there and thinking about, God, what did they say in the moment that photo was taken? So I get, I get goosebumps all the time being in these spots. Um, Roosevelt goes back to the Wawana. Again, they still haven't gotten over the fact that he didn't stay there. He has another lunch there, though. But while he's there, he has one more meeting he wants to take. Next to the Wawana, there's a, a little living quarters. It's, a, it's an artist garret, a studio. And Th Thomas Hill, you may have heard of. If you don't know him, you know his paintings. Thomas Hill painted the beautiful oils of the Yosemite Valley. He was an artist in residence up there. And he lived at the Wawana Hotel. If you go there today, his studio is the uh, National Park Visitor Center. And so that's Roosevelt greeting Hill's wife. Roosevelt goes in there, and Hill can't believe it. Hill loves Roosevelt, Roosevelt loves Hill, and they have this meeting in there. And they had stayed, Roosevelt's third night was at um, Bridalville Fall, in the midst of the waterfall. And it really, just by all accounts, that was his favorite night in terms of scenery. And Hill says to him, how have you enjoyed our valley? And Roosevelt says, well, it was astounding, especially last night. Something about sleeping in the meadow, the waterfall. So they're in front of a giant painting of Bridal Veil, and Hill says to him, um, I want, you know, again, presidential gifts, I want to give you this painting. And so the National Park, I went in there, I wanted to know exactly where the painting had hung. There's still a space on the wall where it had been. I get this story that the painting comes off the wall, it's put on a train, packed up, it's actually put on the stagecoach. The next day, and actually that day after um, he gets the painting, they get on the stagecoach, eight hours back to Raymond, they get on the train, it takes off, Muir departs at Merced, they say goodbye. They have a friendship that goes on for years until Muir dies. But what I did at the end of the book was I was curious. I wanted to know how Roosevelt stayed in touch with people from this trip. So I looked up letters that he might have written. There's a single letter from Roosevelt to Thomas Hill, and it was written in July of that year. Roosevelt gets back on June 1st, so two months later, the end of July. A letter goes out to Hill. It says, my dear Mr. Hill, thank you for... Um, you know, your hospitality, and in particular, thank you for sending me your, your glorious painting. And I thought, well, that's weird. When you do write books like I do, and you're kind of a historian type, the anomaly in that sentence was, thank you for what? For sending me the painting. That didn't make sense, because all accounts at National Park are that the painting left with, with Roosevelt on the train. So I thought, why? That's, that's, that's got to be resolved. I go back to Yosemite to the Wawana Library. They have a great little microfilm library, for those of you who remember microfilm. Back in 1903, there was a little paper called the San Francisco Call. They were in business for about maybe 10 years. They covered Yosemite heavily, and they had a reporter in the room that day who witnessed this exchange. And I found this one little sentence um, in the reporter's story, and it said they discussed the painting, and Hill said to the president, I want to give you this painting, but I mean, I saw, when I looked this up, by the way, at the White House archive, I thought it was gorgeous, but I thought, why is it in storage? You know what I mean? Here you've got this little figure and the great thing. Why is it in storage? But then I learned when I saw that one sentence, it said, I want you to have this painting, but not before I paint you into it. So um, that's what it looked like originally. After meeting Roosevelt, he put Roosevelt in the foreground. It took him a month or so to do it. So he made it, so I thought, wait a minute, now it's a presidential portrait and nobody knows it. You know what I mean? So I, um, if you look closer at the detail, you get closer, you can see it even res resembles him. So I thought this was really interesting. So I, at the same time, was working on a book with a, a memoir with John Oates from Hall & Oates, who's a big history fan. And they had just, I told John this story, they had just played the White House at the Obama's request last year. And John said, well, you got to, this, this has got to happen. He goes, what do you want to happen with that painting? I said, I think that painting should be in the Roosevelt Room at the White House, which is the conference. It was Teddy's old office. It's a conference room today. So John got me the name of the uh, Michelle Obama's chief of staff, who he had just met at the White House. He sent her my research. She wrote me in like two days and said, this is amazing. They went and extricated the painting to have placed in the Roosevelt Room to have it freed up. Because now they understood that it was not just a painting, but it was a picture of Teddy Roosevelt in this element that helped you know, generate and spark the national park system. I know we have a, we have a program where we're going to look at some Teddy Roosevelt footage now. We're going to look at the, uh, the earliest known film footage of Teddy Roosevelt on this trip in San Francisco. 
And are you going to play for these? Oh, we're so blessed. Thank you so much. This is, to me, what makes this place so amazingly magical, is hearing live music against the film screen. So thank you for being here. I can, I'll be over here at intermission. I can take questions over there. Thank you so much. I know I rambled a bit. I can't help it. It's Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir. Thank you very much.